Today's episode of Vice Versa, we're talking about Ford and VW's battery supplier getting banned in the US, Ford investing $1 billion into the European EV plants, GM going carbon neutral by 2040, and Tesla owners staying warm in the absolutely brutal weather that's hitting Texas right now. As usual, I'm joined by Ricky. How you doing, Ricky? I'm doing doing good. All of our viewers were in Texas. Hope you guys are doing all right. I, yeah. I know it's been a crazy situation over there, but I'm, I've been I've been doing good. I just spent the entire day in a Ford Mach E. Spent the whole day just driving around. <laughs> really cool car. Well, we awesome. have we have that on the board. We'll talk about it. How about yeah, you? How was your week? The week was good. A little hectic, but it was good. At least you know I I I also want to put my uh, heart out for all the folks in Texas because what's going on right there is a. Uh, it's brutal. I really hope you guys get guys get through it really quick. I know it's supposed to warm up like into the 60s by like Sunday. So there is kind of a light at the end of the tunnel, but then there's the recovery because of all the burst pipes and everything like that. So my heart goes out to you guys. Yeah, I think electrical will come back before water, but exactly. Hope you guys are all staying safe out there. Yeah. Let's get right into it and talk about our very first story. Um, you know, Matt and I are really bullish about the future of EVs. We love what's happening. So we talk about the, the positives and all the cool stuff about New Frontiers, but there are some dark sides as well. One of them is the story title is Ford F-150 EV battery supplier will be banned from the U.S. for 10 years. But really, it's not about the Ford F-150 per se. It's about a company from South Korea called SK Innovations. And basically, they've been alleged for having... Uh, stolen some trade secrets and some IP from LG Chem. So LG Chem has been um, litigating them to ban them from being able to operate in the U.S. and they've recently just won. So they are not going to be able to produce batteries for cars in these states for a 10-year period. And I think that'll start in a couple of years. So potentially we might actually see Ford F-150s start with them and then see this company uh, go under this ban. So um, it feels, you know, litigious, of course, but at the same time, you know, when you put in dedicated thousands of hours of engineering time to come up with some of this IP, you'd hate to see it stolen. We've seen this before. For example, Neo was, you know, um, stealing some stuff from Tesla and some other IP. So this is kind of the dark side whenever you've got like a uh, emerging market and all this interest and, and investment. Uh, the dark side is that you're going to have theft and, and this sort of thing. So um, I'm, I'm still kind of trying to figure out what I want to make of it. This is the uh, the pictures of the F-150. I, To be honest with you, I, I still can't believe they're going to build an F-150 EV that looks just like this and doesn't have any extra arrow or anything. Um, but yeah, I don't know what they're going to do now. They're going to have to scramble. But there are some other really big time players like LG Chem. So they're going to have to figure out battery supply, and it ain't going to come from SK Innovation, which, <laughs> you know, we talk about how much we need batteries. Um, it's kind of a step in the wrong direction, but that is uh, that is where we are. Yeah, I mean, to, to add to that, it was um, they had stolen, not stolen, hired, like, what was it, 70 employees <laughs> from LG, and that's how they got all this information over. And then the other thing that they, um, that came out of the order was they, they were being allowed to sell batteries to Ford for four years to help Ford build out the Ford F-150. And they're also doing the same thing for VW. They're giving them two years to sell batteries to VW to give them time to find new suppliers and alternatives. And the sad part is, is that uh, SK just built a battery factory in Georgia that was gonna be employing something like 2,600 uh, people. And now that's just out the window. So that means those 2,600 people are probably gonna be losing their jobs at some point soon over the next year or two. So there's a, double-edged sword to this it's like yeah sk probably did some bad things <laughs> stealing this this uh this stuff but at the same time the consequences aren't going to be hitting the company as much as it's going to be hitting all the employees they'll be losing work and that's how it always goes whenever there's any kind of <clears throat> malfeasance from a company it's always the the workers the people who who need employment the most you know the people who have the most to lose who who, who lose the most yep. um but yeah, we'll, we'll cover this one as it comes up uh, further. We don't really have too much more in the way of like some of these details. And also, some of this stuff changes as we get closer to that ban date. So maybe there's some lot settlement. Like if SK has got an F-150 contract, they're making tons of money. Maybe they come in and say, we're going to pay this fee. Can we do something about it? And there's there's a chance they can work it out. But it is a yeah. a glimpse of rem just keeping, keeping that in mind that there is... There's other things that we have to keep about. It's not all sunshine and rainbows, pretty much. Yeah. So next up, which is kind of very closely related to this, <laughs> is um, 
Ford is investing $1 billion to build an electric vehicle factory in Germany. They're converting one of their existing factories over to being an EV factory. And $1 billion doesn't sound like a lot of money, but when you take into consideration that Ford also recently announced that they're going to be investing $22 billion over the next five years to help with the transition over to uh, battery cars and hybrid cars, this does feel like a drop in the bucket with the amount of money that they're spending, which makes me wonder where's the rest of the money going. But it is nice to see that they're making that investment. But the other side of this that I kind of wanted to bring up is that uh, Ford is using VW's uh, MEB platform for their, their EVs. So they're spending $22 billion, but it doesn't look like that money's going into investing their own platform architecture, like what GM's doing. They're, they're just riding the coattails of another business, which is concerning to me. Uh, they also, they, and because of this, they seem to be hedging their bets uh, because of where they're putting their money. As part of this, they're going all electric in Europe by 2030 because they have to, but they don't have to do that here in the United States. So the cars they're going to be selling here in the United States by 2026 are still going to have a bunch of uh, hybrid vehicles in there. So there's still going to be gasoline vehicles here in the United States, even though they're building out pure EVs over in Europe. So it seems to be like they're they're not fully invested in the transition to electric, which is something that's really kind of concerning to me when you look at a company like GM, which is building out their own battery, battery plants. They're building out their own electric vehicle plants. They're investing, I think it's like $28 billion or something like that into going electric. They have their own p platform. It seems like they've they drank the Kool-Aid. <laughs> where where Ford still seems like they're, you know, we're still testing this out. We're not going to go all in quite yet, which is something that has me just a little concerned about the choices they're making and not investing in the right places. What, what's your take? That's perfect. You're, I, <laughs> I think you hit it on the head. You know, what's funny, though, is people have... I saw a tweet, uh, there's like a Twitter poll. People said, who's doing better with EVs, Ford or GM? And people voted Ford. And what's funny is the reason why is they see the Mach-E. And yeah. in a way, Ford has been brilliant in a kind of underhanded way. They really don't have a platform. They've invested in Rivian. They're basically saying, hey, you go do it. We have money. We have no interest in doing it ourselves. We're going to pay to. Using the Volkswagen platform, that is inexcusable for a massive car company. This is Ford Motor Company. Uh, to me, that's incredibly um, disappointing. And this is why we don't talk about Ford nearly as much as GM, uh, you and I, on our show. But um, there's some drawbacks to when you don't invest. For example, the Ford uh, Mach-E is an incredibly amazing car. I was just recording some video about it. But when you open the door, you know, the area between the sill and the, uh, the weather strip for the door, there's this like, 10 inch underhang that kind of goes below that and it covers this massive little area under the bottom of the car where the batteries go now when i look at my tesla i don't see that it looks like there's nothing it doesn't even i can't really even tell you where the batteries go to my mind i think this is they don't like whatever platform the maki is built on i have to research a little bit more i just saw this today it isn't perfect it isn't really fully um, maybe optimized for an EV or it, the battery pack storage isn't perfect. So they have to play these games with this huge door that hangs low to make it. It's kind of like the um, people who wear high, men who wear high heels, <laughs> but the shoes are designed to look like they're very stealth and there's not a heel in it, but there's, that's what it is, right? It's yeah. kind of like that. Um, so I'm with you on that. Um, Germany makes sense as, as far as where to build a factory for the EVs in Europe. Europe is going to be where they're going to have their feet to the fire first. And Ford sells a lot of cars. And Ford is actually considered kind of a premier brand. People like like the Ford Mondeo is a classic sedan in, in Europe. Um, I actually think people like Ford more in places like the UK than they do in America, personally. But yeah, good move there. But I think you're starting to see how behind they are, especially considered when you consider GM. But they've been smart in terms of getting PR cred yes. by doing something as beautiful as the Maki. -E. So, yeah. again, maybe double-edged sword. <laughs> it's definitely a double-edged sword. It's, it's sad to me because I love Ford. I love them. I've, I've owned Ford. I had a Ford Fusion hybrid that I loved. <laughs> My parents owned Fords when I was growing up. I, I, I love Ford. It's really sad to see them just seeding the future, just kind of giving up and just kind of like letting other people do it. And it's like, 
they're gonna they're behind and by doing it this way they're gonna continue to be behind and everybody else is going to like vw gm tesla lucid rivian they're all gonna like just like a thousand miles an hour down the road where ford's gonna be kind of left behind um doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to go to business. It just, they're going to be so far right. behind. It's, it's ridiculous. So do you yeah. want to, do you want to, do you want to yeah. move on to the, your This transition is very nicely <laughs> to what I've been doing. Yes. What yeah. I, what I've been yeah. doing all day today is driving the 2121 Ford Mach-E. So I don't know, have you seen any where you live? But here in California, they're starting to make their way onto the street. Haven't seen and, a single one. No? Okay. They'll probably come out here in California first, but. They're, they're going to reach you pretty quickly. And it is a, yeah, so if you check out my screen, I have a little video. I wasn't able to do much in the way of editing or anything, so bear with me. But this is, we just went out to the beach, uh, you know, kind of a brutal San Diego day. But I just got a little little footage of the thing. And first and foremost, I got to say, the car is gorgeous. I think this is one, it, one of the prettiest EVs you can buy today. Um, really, I really do. So, you can't really tell on this shot here, but um, I will make a video and we'll, we'll talk about that little area I mentioned where the battery pack area seems really tall for, to, for whatever reason. But my, my, um, my basic takeaway from the day that I had it is it's a really comfortable car. The interior materials are nice. Inside and outside, it's a very attractive vehicle. But the problem that I have with it is the pedal feel. I, I think the biggest uh, issue that I had was when you, like the first 20, 25% of the accelerator and the brake pedal, it is just very coggy and it just doesn't feel smooth at all. Tesla, even from when I bought it to today, they, their pedal feel from zero to 100% accelerator or brake is perfection. What you want is a really nice like linear signal because the, the accelerator pedal is fly-by-wire, meaning it's just a joystick that you're moving and it, the, the feedback of the position is sent to a computer to, to, to analyze. And my Tesla, it's perfect. The more you, the more you push, and you can just creep on it, like millimeter by millimeter, and you can feel the torque from the electric motors rise. Uh, in the Ford, in the first like 10, 20 percent, it was just really coggy. Like you could feel like there's like some clicks, and it felt like an automatic transmission finding a gear is what what it kind of felt like. After that, it was nice and smooth. The brakes as well were really grabby, and it felt like a switch. You put your foot over to the brake, and it just feels like it's either on or off. Again, not a nice linear um, feedback. So that was really annoying. And actually, it's annoying enough, especially if you live in a place where there's rush hour traffic, that it would bug you. It would bug you a lot. It was just jerky. In my pilot, in my Tesla, I could put like a full cup of water, and it wouldn't even move if I was driving <laughs> it. I could just be so smooth with it. And that is not the case with the, with the Mach-E, at least in my time with it. UI-wise, I would actually love your input, being the designer, the UX designer, to see what you think of it. Um, I think Ford has a, a little ways to go. Generally, I've, I found it to be clunky. Like, you know, a seat heater, typically you click it once and it's full power, three mm -hmm. three bars. Yeah. You click it again, now it's two bars. One more time, one bar, and then off. This, you click the what you thought would do that. It brings up a menu, and you now have to drag your finger to the power levels, and all while I'm operating the car. There just didn't feel like there was any need for that. It, that yeah. could have been done better. Um, the HVAC controls to bring that up covers the entire screen, and... It's again kind of weird because now if I was navigating or I had you know directions, I'm blocking all that to be able to turn off things and stuff. Still very mechanical. All the um, vents and stuff have the manual controls, which means if you want to turn off the air in the back for the kids, you have to reach back and like turn it off. You can't just turn it off on the screen. Okay. You have a start button still. Okay, this is the worst part. Ford has to never do this again. Like now you've made one EV. Like don't ever do this again. Which is when you go into the car. First of all, it has a key fob and stuff. You go in and you hit a start button. What am I starting? There's no electric starter motor or anything. I hit a start button. Then all these like gauges turn on. Then I have to choose the uh, the um, the gear selector, which is a knob. And the area where that gear selector knob sits takes up so much room that could have just been like cargo space. On the way out, it's the same thing. You park the car. Now I have to put it into park. I have to put a, 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 an e-brake. I have to manually set it, then turn, open the door, and the door starts screaming like, hey, turn the car off, it's still on. Like, what do you mean it's still on? Just turn off, it's an electric car. I gotta come <laughs> back and turn the start button off. In my Tesla, I don't even put it in park. I just pull into my garage, open the door, the car automatically goes into park, handbrake is applied, car turns off, you live your life. It plays a little bit of music, turns on the lights for a little bit, and then automatically turns off. 
this is what happens when you have a, a, a relic kind of like, it's like the appendix, right? This is Ford mm-hmm. who's built gas cars and they haven't figured out like, don't do these things anymore. This is not what anybody wants to do. They've had to do it because there is no other way. So um, the overall takeaway is I think it's the most beautiful EV. Um, Electrify America, you and I should do an entire episode about because my first <laughs> experience was not positive. A lot of yeah. the stalls didn't work. It was a mess. Uh, it runs on Windows 7 Embedded Edition, and it mm-hmm. crashed. I saw the Windows 7 crash screen, oh, and I saw like the yeah, I saw the BIOS boot up screen. Oh <laughs> no! Like, what what century is this? Like they have a long way to go. I, I would I would say. So, infrastructure charging clearly Tesla. The little bit of refinement for EV motor control Tesla by uh, what feels like a million miles right now. Beauty, honestly, I think the Mach E is way better looking than than the. Model Y, but that's just me. Um, is that enough to make you want to buy one? That's where we'll have to drive on yourself the, or watch my video. How is the regen braking? Were you able to do like one pedal driving at all in the car? The one pedal driving is decent. It's not as aggressive as Tesla. A Tesla, I've always said, it feels like a motorcycle. If you get off the throttle on yeah. a motorcycle, you get thrown forward, and that's how I feel in my in my Tesla. So it's not quite that level. But as long as that you're predicting where you're stopping ahead of time, yeah, one foot braking is no problem. Nice. But again, it just isn't quite as smooth. That 10 to 20 percent for the for the pedal feel for both the, the accelerator and the brake just need a little more refinement to be more linear, um, is what I'd say. What about the knob that's in the screen? Isn't there a knob? I like thought right it'd be back? cool when I first saw it, thinking, oh, one tactile knob. Yeah. Uh, as soon as I got in it, I realized, like, get rid of that Why? and give Why? me more screen. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if you have a nice rolling <laughs> for volume on your on your steering wheel. Yeah. Um, which the steering wheel controls are okay. It has like autopilot, by the way. It was driving mm-hmm. itself to the beach. Pretty cool, right? Yeah. Um, I don't know how many other Ford cars have that, but, but kind of cool when your first EV starts with like all your greatest stuff. Do you, I was gonna ask you, I haven't done the research yet because I I parked like thirty minutes ago. Do you know how are they using mobile eye or do you know who they're partnering with for self driving? I don't know. I really don't. It'll be good. Yeah. I'll, I'll check the comments. I'm sure somebody's writing it as we Some, speak. Somebody probably knows. Yeah. <laughs> what do you think? What, what's your take on it? I think it's a gorgeous car. Like when it was first announced, I, I, I like that Ford styling. So when it came out, I was like, I was in, I thought it was gorgeous. I was very excited. Even though the range wasn't quite there with compared to like a model Y, it didn't really matter too much. I didn't, I didn't think it was going to be like a showstopper for it. Cause it's a beautiful car. It's going to have decent range. Uh, it's good, a good size. My question was, how does it ride? How does it drive? Like, what's it feel like? Because driving a Tesla is it's just a blast to drive that car. So if you're talking about two cars that looks is very subjective, but like the Teslas are nice, the Ford is nice, but if the driving experience of the Tesla is just hands down more enjoyable than the Ford, it's like that that's not a good sign. Yeah, uh, to the the ride comfort question, it rides like an SUV, which I think a lot of people will like. Yeah, um, I like the sedan. I like low, high performance, like low roll, um, more like you know on rails kind of a feel. I've always been more of a performance person. So for me, I found the um, the suspension tune to be on the soft side, and I think it's a little bit softer than the Model Y, which it also means it's more comfortable. Like you hit some of the bigger bumps and stuff there on the beach. And it just absorbed it. It was really, really comfortable. I think it'd be a great road trip car. Also, uh, Juan, my editor, mentioned that the back seat, way more comfortable than the Model Y. Just the foam and the just the thigh support and stuff. It was just more comfortable of a seat. Right. The front seat, I thought it was pretty similar. I love the Tesla seats. I have no problem with it. Um, I thought it was pretty similar as well. But headroom was good. The way they build the glass and stuff is all really comfortable. Um, you got to just get on Turo as soon as there's one in your area. Yeah. If you're curious about it, you got to drive it for a weekend. You really do. And then you you can you can decide because maybe the things I'm saying you don't bother you or you disagree. And it, a lot of it is really is subjective, like you said. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping somebody in the Boston area has one I can borrow or ride in at some point. I'm sure there will be. It's like but I, just, I really want to get my hands on it and try it out because I was very excited for it. I still am excited for it. So I hope I hope people like it and I hope it's popular enough and does it sells well for Ford enough to convince them to actually get into EVs, not just to dip their toe in. Yeah. Yeah. The owner who I, I borrowed it from, he mentioned that he paid five thousand dollars over sticker. Whoa. And he negotiated that down from ten thousand dollars over sticker, which is what they wanted. Wow. 
What? That's insane. So, the, I, me- I forgot to mention one thing. You're still dealing with Ford and the DSBS dealership network stuff. You're not buying a car online that everybody buys the same price and you go check out and it shows up. You're dealing with the stale coffee and the guy and that old back room. You're dealing with all that BS. So don't forget that part too. I kind of forgot about that after my last car. But yeah, you got to go back and deal with all that stuff. I bought and if my it Tesla- proves to be too popular. I bought my Tesla on my iPhone. It's like, come on, Ford. How cool is that, right? Come on, Ford. <laughs> and if it proves to be too popular, the markup over MSRP might be between five and ten thousand dollars, which That's... eats up your entire federal credit. Which means, why? You're basically giving your federal tax credit to the dealership. Yep. I don't. I don't like that idea for some reason. It doesn't sit well with me. <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> well. To transition to the next story, which is we're going to move away from Ford and we're going to jump over to GM uh, for a little bit. Um, we keep bringing up GM because there's, they're doing a lot of interesting things right now. Uh, right now, th- they just had a um, the chief sustainability officer, uh, Dane Parker, had an interview on PBS NewsHour, which if I, I, ha- I highly recommend that if uh, you go watch it if you can, because he is very open, he's very candid in this interview, and he says a lot of very interesting things about what they're planning on doing. So the, we all knew that they were planning on going all EV by 2035, but what they're now saying is that they're going to be going uh, carbon neutral by 2040, or attempting to go carbon neutral by 2040. So this is be, this is going a step beyond that 2035 number. Uh, the challenge here though, is that in the United States, Tesla owns 79% of the market share for EVs. So there's 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 a lot of room of opportunity here, which is why I'm so nuts about Ford kind of only dipping their toe in, where GM seems to be going in the right direction because there's so much opportunity for another player in the market. Um, they're aspiring to be carbon emission free, which is the word that they chose is aspiring, which gives them an out, which kind of has a negative connotation to it. But to quote Dane Parker from the interview, uh, this commitment to be carbon neutral is a commitment to change our products and our operational footprint, exclusive of, car- exclusive of carbon credits or carbon offsets. And why we're now spending $27 billion in the next five years to do exactly that. Roll out these products faster than we ever have before. And as part of this, they're using the, he, he t- termed it the scientific based, the science-based target methodology to achieve net zero, which means they can't just buy carbon offsets just to call it a day. They, they are doing everything they can to try to get to carbon neutral until they get to that very last step where they have to buy offsets to get those last uh, bits over because they're going to be doing more solar on their factories, more renewable energy on their factories and office buildings, obviously trying to go emission free on the tailpipes of all the cars they build. So it seems to me Unlike Ford, which is what we were just talking about, it seems to me I see a, a huge glimmer of hope for what GM is doing here. It does it does seem to me like they're going down the right path. I just wish Ford would follow suit. So this kind of made me think from our previous story about how the Mach-E is really attractive. They made a very desirable car, um, <clears throat> which is kind of almost like cheating because they haven't really done the work and it kind of shows because if you look at like what's their next ev going to be it's not really clear that ford f-150 but again that feels like just a ford f-150 on its own platform there's it doesn't seem to be like you're moving with momentum so gm is doing all that stuff but what i you know gm had their unveil for the new bolt um that's another can of worms but i i almost feel like what what's hurting gm is they haven't figured out how to make a really desirable ev yet uh, the new Bolt, I think, is a, is a vast improvement from the old one. But I wouldn't call it a car that people are clamoring over. I wouldn't call it a car that people are going to go to a dealership and pay $5,000 over MSRP for. And mm-hmm. that's where they're at right now. I almost feel like what GM should do is go, okay, C8 Corvette, mid-engine, first Corvette, with all these different things, uh, for, first mid-engine Corvette. C9 is going to be electric. It's going to smoke people and it's going to be like a $50,000 supercar electric or 60, 70, kind of in that range. They need to do something to get a halo effect going. The Hummer will do that. I think that Lyric kind of mm-hmm. designed for the Cadillac is going to do that as well. Um, but they need the, the Bolt. Um, 
was was not a great first EV the way the Mach-E has, is going to prove to be. Because even though it's cheap, first of all, like the average EV buyer is probably making a little bit more money, probably has a little more disposable income. They would probably pay ten or twelve or fifteen thousand dollars more for better sound insulation, not that tin can feel the bolt always had more premium features and better range or whatnot. So I think GM needs to um, balance the the smart and the pragmatic that they've really clearly been mm-hmm. doing with a little more <clears throat> marketing and sex appeal, a little more of that kind of oomph. And they need to try to get cars that people want to buy because you can go walk into a dealership and lowball them on a bolt and probably pick one up. Like they're yeah. not selling all that well. So let's hope that we balance those two because otherwise if GM does all this and they're making cars that nobody wants to buy, that that's not going to be a winning formula. Yeah. That's a really good point. I've never thought of them as a pragmatic auto manufacturer, but they really are. It's like, they're very functional. They're just getting Lately, the job done yeah. where Ford's doing a better job with that sex appeal. Tesla of course has the massive sex appeal. I mean, sexy is it's in their product names, but it's just, they need a little bit more of that appeal and, I think a Corvette would be a great way to start that. They need to do things to really kind of amp that up. I agree. I think the Hummer needs to be here like ASAP. Yeah. That will do it. If you got, you know, uh, the first time some guy who loves his big off-roading pick- pickup truck, the first time one of his buddies comes with a Hummer EV and smokes him in every regard, uh, <laughs> that will be when this kind of starts to happen and when yeah. that halo effect will start to form. So uh, that'll be an expensive truck. That won't be for everybody by any means, but... They need to figure out, so they'll have that figured out. They got to figure out a $40,000 really desirable car. Give it Super Cruise, give it all that kind of stuff, and make it just sexy. And don't do a pragmatic hatchback. Make it a, a Grand Coupe or, or something, or, you know, like a four door sports saloon, something yeah. really hot and sexy. And I think they'll, they'll do well. Aspirational. Yeah, exactly. The kit, the poster, right? People always make this kind of analogy, but it's so true. The aspirational, the, the poster on your wall. What What is an eight-year-old, 12-year-old kid uh, have a car poster of on their wall? Make it that car that people want to have. Like the Kun- it's, like, it's not going to be the lyric. Up, it was a, They're not going to have a lyric on their, their wall, a nice poster of a lyric. And, oh, that's a- <laughs> When they're 40 and they have a hedge fund manager and they have two <laughs> kids and <laughs> they're paying for a private school, maybe. But again, that's, that's not, you know, it has to be... The lyric will be cool for a lot of people, but there needs to be that that thing. A C9 electric Corvette. I'm calling it right now. The next generation Corvette will be electric and it's going to be like bonkers. Because they have, talk about like chassis tuning and like the engineering, hardcore engineering side of it. GM. Like the the Corvette is really a master class of how to build a sports car for cheap. Yeah. They start like $50,000 and they're, they're, they're competitive with quarter million dollar Porsches and stuff. So yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm cheering for them because I, I do think that they... Um, by the way, uh, bef- one, more, one more, this is our last story, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, so I want to touch on something that Dan Caro uh, mentioned in the comment section. He says, as a 71 Mustang Mach 1 owner, I hate that they're calling this a Mustang. WTF, were they, what were they thinking? Call it anything but a Mustang. But that's exactly what Ford was so clever to figure out. They literally called this thing a Mustang, and then they said, well, it has to look good if it's going to be called a Mustang. And then there they are. They have yep. this car that people are really going to want to buy. If you're an enthusiast, hardcore Mustang fan, you probably hate that this crossover family SUV that's electric and quiet is called a Mustang. But the reality is, from a marketing perspective, pretty brilliant. And yep. I think GM could maybe steal a play from that playbook a little bit here. Yeah. The last story is yep. what we talked about in the very beginning, which is that Tesla owners and Tesla owners have been kind of saved in Texas with what's going on with the weather. So if you've kind of been following the news, uh, the entire state of Texas really has been in a, a state of emergency. And it was fueled by this in like once in a you know century cold snap where people in Houston had snow on their on their patios, which is absurd if you've ever been to Houston. It's really hot and humid all pretty much all year. It doesn't really get that cold. They have the Gulf kind of as a blanket to keep them warm, but huge power outages and also uh, burst pipes where Mr. Farrell lives. People are prepared for the cold. They know it's coming. But in some of these regions, they really weren't probably winterized enough. And as a result, we have burst pipes or homes without uh, without water and without electricity. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Robert, who we met at Fully Charged Live, 
lives in Houston, and he got power back yesterday. So I think I've made some calls, and I think people are starting to get power back, but there's still no water. And so the the um, the call was to melt snow for water, and that worked for a while, but the snow is now clearing. Yeah. And the crazy part about this, and you know, Texas is probably one of those states that hasn't really been a big been a big believer, uh, at least at large, about global warming and climate change. But they're going to go from 10 degree weather, which was, you know, 20 degrees below freezing Fahrenheit to 70 degree weather in like a couple of days. It's going to be back to normal and, and hot and, you know, and humid. So um, these kinds of swings are really brutal for anybody and any kind of a power company. I have friends with children trying to stay warm. So this story is about how Tesla owners, first of all, if you have a power wall, you had electricity. And so there's pictures um, I think that article that we we had there didn't have pictures, but we um, there's pictures you, you'll see online where there are like single, you know, dots of 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 light in entirely dark neighborhoods, and those are the homes that have Tesla Powerwall. And I just recently learned that LG Chem is getting out of the business of of yeah, there look yeah look at this, yeah that is haunting is what that is. But I just heard that LG Chem is getting out of. We're not going to be building their um, home battery any longer. So the Tesla Powerwall is going to almost stand alone um, as the kind of one of the very few really good choices out there. But for people who this happened to, they're going to have that thought now that even in Texas, where they take so much pride in being energy independent, and I'm sure you're, you're going to touch base on that here in a short in a second. But yeah, this could happen to anybody. And even if you didn't have a Tesla Powerwall, having a huge 75 to 100 kilowatt hour battery pack in your tesla car people were camping inside their cars with camp mode maybe the fireplace uh wallpaper (laughs) and keeping their families warm as you can imagine if you don't have electricity you might think oh i have a gas heater well you don't have a blower (laughs) so you're you can't run central heating so really i think what came down to was if you had a gas fireplace you were okay you just had to get a lighter to light that so people would use that otherwise uh a wood fireplace and blankets, tons of blankets and stuff. It's um, it's really sad because in places where it's really warm, you don't invest in. You probably have like the most airtight windows and airtight doors. I don't. I can I can see sunlight through some of my doors. Oh, I just don't really worry too much because it's not that right. I know you're you're. I but need you'd, be, you'd benefit from air audit. conditioning, not like getting out of the house. I mean, so true. There's, there's benefits. True. I need to do an energy audit like you did. But I mean, in these kinds of places like where we live, people. You know that they're not ready for it is the best way to put it. And if you can like change the climate of our planet so much that you can't predict anything, uh, that's just going to become a very tough thing to manage. What you yeah. what you take away from all this that happened this week? Yeah, there's been so much that's been coming out about this. That initially there was all these reports that were kind of pointing the fingers at renewables as being one of the problems with this, because the wind turbines froze and they weren't turning anymore. Uh, the solar was covered with snow, so it wasn't generating electricity. And so people were pointing their fingers, ah, see, renewables. Well, the governor even came out and said, yeah, but our nuclear power plants weren't producing electricity that, like they needed to be. The coal and natural gas plants just like were completely ill-equipped to handle this and just weren't able to keep up. So wind, which is like 25% of the power grid versus coal and natural gas, which is like 68% of their power grid, it's you can't completely point your finger at renewables. It was just a complete failure across the board of their entire grid. And there's still going to be a lot to come out about this. So some of what I'm about to say is still early reporting, but some of the reports I've been seeing were that there were reports from the last time they got snow. It was like a decade ago when something like this happened before, but not this bad. Uh, there were reports that came out that said they had to like shore up their grid. They had to uh, winterize and weatherize some of their grid infrastructure to prevent issues and they did none of it so it's like then you have this once in a hundred year storm come through and it just knocked everything out and my <laughs> i don't want to say it's my favorite part but the part about it is in the united states we have kind of the west coast grid that's all kind of shared across the states in the west coast like the west side then there's the east coast area where it's like all shared and then there's texas And Texas is a grid that is not shared with anybody else. So if there's a massive storm, like in Minneapolis, it's like they can pull power from Canada. They can pull power from 
shared resources to shore up their grid and make sure there's enough energy. Texas is an island to itself. They don't share their energy and they don't pull energy from elsewhere. And so that's part of the reason why you have this slightly fragile grid that was not equipped to handle this massive storm and they couldn't pull, pull energy in from surrounding states. It was just, it was the perfect st storm, literally, in every way you look at that, to just knock them out and just completely obliterate this. And for me, it's like there's um, a podcaster, his name's Dan Benjamin, Dan Benjamin. He runs the 5x5 network. He had a live stream earlier today and he lives in Austin. And he was saying the situation there is like catastrophic right now. And he said the thing that's really terrifying him is there, there's the boil water order going on. But he said everybody he knows doesn't have water running. Like nobody can even get water. And so they were in like, you can't get to the stores because the stores are all closed because they don't have power. They're flooding. Pipes are bursting everywhere. So you can't go to a store to buy bottled water. You can't get, it's like, where are we going to get drinking water? So he had gone into his office because he had one of those like water, like dispenser jugs in his office. So he was going to his office to take that jug and take it back home so his family could have water. And so he said, it, it, with all the burst pipes, it's like, it's going to be 68 degrees on Sunday. But think about all the burst pipes that are across all of Texas right now. So even when the water does come back on, you're still technically probably not going to have water because pipes have been burst and they have to be fixed. And it's going to take months. It's going to be months before they kind of climb out of this mess. It's it's going to be awful. I feel I feel so bad for everybody in Texas right now. And I really do hope that they can turn a corner quickly and get supplies to the people they need that need it when they need it as quickly as possible. Yeah, this, yeah. You know, when you have family and friends in Texas, I, I have a lot of family and some friends as well. Um, that's what you think about. But th I, on Twitter, I realized quickly that this was politicized in a big way. Yes. Um, people were calling out Ted Cruz, for example, because he gave California a hard time saying that we were this joke of a place that couldn't even keep the power on and stuff. And they're giving him a hard time. It's like, well, I don't think anyone is going to argue with any of that kind of stuff, but there's still people like really suffering. Um, especially I, I, I have, so I had a friend who has children, like young children. That's got it. I, my wife and I were just like sick of it, thinking about what we would do if something like that happened. Um, it makes us really happy to have a power wall. You have a power mm -hmm. wall as well. Yeah. Uh, honestly, if you have a little bit of electricity, it doesn't even have to be that much. It's shocking how far that can go. If you have a gas furnace, like we do, uh, even heating, if it was like, you know, zero, like it was really freezing out there. Um, isn't so bad because it's not the heating that you have to power with electricity. It's just the blower, which is maybe a thousand watts or so. It's not, it's like a, it's not that bad, but yeah. What do you do when you don't have water? I mean, that's, um, yeah. and there was so much reporting about like renewable energies being the culprit that that's where we, that's kind of where we live now it is like, you can't just try to figure out how to solve a problem or do better. You got to like find a scapegoat. Like that's what we, that's like the, the knee jerk reaction now. No matter what happens, the first thing, who can we blame this on? Oh, it's renewables, wind turbines froze. Um, I'd have to get into more about like a nuclear reaction doesn't stop at <laughs> 10 oh. degrees Fahrenheit. So, but there's other considerations, I guess. Well, wind turbines don't stop in the winter if they're weatherized. It's like you, you can go up yeah. to Minnesota and they have wind turbines that turn off. Because they're, they're prepared for it. They have heaters on them that keep them warm enough so they don't stop. They didn't do that in Texas because they don't get cold yeah. weather. So they didn't even bother doing it. So it's like, that's kind of why it's like pointing your finger at renewables is the problem. It's part of the problem because it's yeah. not that the renewables are the issue. It's that you weren't prepared for this style of weather to come into your area. So they hadn't winterized any of their stuff. So it's How that's, why the, that's why the pipes are bursting. That's why it's like everything's going sideways because they just are not prepped for this. Like they are, like we are in the Northeast. Everything is winterized here. So it's right. like we don't have this problem. We still have power outages because a tree might fall on a power line. But not much our, we can do about our that. pipes yeah. aren't bursting. Our, you know, we're, we're, we're ready for this. So it's it's that's the biggest problem here is how do you prepare for climate change when it's throwing everything out of whack? And this is going to happen more and more often. It's that's. You have to rely on your neighbors. So it brings me back to Texas. You might want to reconsider how you have your grid structured. You might want to like partner up with your neighbors, the states around you, and tap into surrounding uh, grids to prevent something like this from ever happening again. The, the crazy part about that, we talked about before the show, I don't care how many power walls I have or how many solar panels I have, I'm going to keep my grid connection. Like there's, 
I mean, what do I have? What am I going to benefit like $18 a month to not have the grid? What if something crazy happens? What if a volcano goes off and there's no sunlight for 30 days? <laughs> I want the grid, like, even if you don't need it and you never need it, but you have it. The peace of mind of a power wall comes from having backup, not from getting rid of the primary, right? So yeah. I think Texas should absolutely connect to the rest of the country. Um, that was fascinating what you mentioned, especially because Texas is a huge state and mm -hmm. you figure they're, they're massive energy producers. Like they take great pride in this. That's why they disconnect. Well then export it, like put up solar everywhere, put up turbines everywhere and sell electricity, make money. That can be a source of revenue just as quickly as it becomes a, a crutch upon which you can import but in an emergency or something if something bad happens you've you've got that as well um yeah uh, it's a it's a tough one but I, I really do hope that we and you mentioned in 2011 this last time there was snow uh, you know along in some of those regions reports come out about how to address this we hear about this too like in intelligence briefings that presidents get from 10 years ago and it's like that little Terrorist plot, uh, literally, we spelled that out. That's exactly what we said. And, and it just kind of falls to deaf ears. It's partly due to the fact that, like, political cycles and, like, ah, oh, it'll be the next guy's problem, not mine. Or um, it's not, you know, you don't have enough political points to get it done. These are the sorts of things I really hope we can find a way past. Because um, you think these things are bad. Imagine when they start piling up quickly enough, right? We get a hurricane and then it's a year before another problem happens. And we can afford that. But if climate change causes things to happen more quickly, insurance companies can't even keep up. We're going to have massive failures of our economy. And um, that's why it's important that we talk about carbon neutrality and electric vehicles and stuff. Yep. So uh, thanks so much for watching and for listening, if you're listening to the podcast. And if you think we've earned it, be sure to subscribe and watch us live every Thursday night at 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern. Or, like I said, listen on the go by subscribing to the podcast at viceversa.show. And it'll be really helpful if you could give the podcast a rating and a review on the podcast platform of your choice. Thanks again, everyone. We'll see you in the next one.